human intelligence has the remarkable ability to quickly adapt to new tasks and environments. Despite the recent breakthroughs of deep learning, most AI models assume that the world is static and that the data for any given task is presented to the model at the time of training. To bring the benefits of AI to a broader set of scenarios, we need to develop AI that can learn to quickly accomplish new tasks and adapt to new and changing environments. Colin Rafal from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill will kick off this session with a call toward building continually improving and collaboratively developed pre-trained models. My colleagues, Ida Momin Jad and David Alvarez Mellers from MSR Labs in New York and New England, will follow with talks on adaptability and model reusability. Hi, my name is Colin Raffel. I'm an assistant professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and today I'm going to be talking about our work that aims to make it possible to build machine learning models in the same way that we build open source software. So historically, when training a machine learning model, it was common to take a data set, take a model that was initialized randomly, and train the model on that data set so that you end up with a model that's specialized just for that individual data set. And this recipe has been applied in many settings. Here are some examples from computer vision, including image classification and segmentation. And with the advent of neural networks, this became a pretty powerful recipe, especially when the data set was labeled so that supervised learning could be used. However, recently, a different paradigm has become a lot more common. In this approach, instead of starting from a randomly initialized model, we first take the model and pre-train it on a large, diverse data set that's related to the data sets that we eventually want to train the model on. So in this slide, we're showing an example from ImageNet, which is a large supervised classification data set that I imagine many of you are familiar with. And ImageNet is a very diverse collection of images, so pre-training the model on this task can provide a good starting point for subsequent training on what we call downstream tasks, like what's shown on the right there. And doing this pre-training step can help the model converge more quickly to a better solution with less labeled data. So it has really become a cornerstone of many pipelines across many applications of machine learning. And in some cases, it's actually possible to take a pre-trained model and apply it to a new task without any additional training. But the most common recipe is the transfer learning recipe that involves fine tuning on the downstream data sets. Uh, another major utility of the transfer learning pipeline is that this pre-training step is often done on very large scale data sets that are uh, readily available in some way. And uh, to give two examples from natural language processing on the left and uh, computer vision on the right, there have been a, there's been a lot of effort in scaling up the size of these models and the data sets they're trained on. And the reason for that is that the gains from this scaling is generally extremely predictable. Uh, in other words, if we make the if we use a larger data set and train a larger model, we can often get much better performance on the down, on downstream tasks. Now, looking into NLP specifically, a, a downside to this increase in scale is that it incurs a increase in computational costs and also financial costs. So, on the left, we're looking at the performance of various large language models on a new benchmark uh, called Big Bench. And the first set of models that were released that are being evaluated in this diagram are the GPT-3 set of models that I imagine many of you are familiar with. Uh, GPT-3 would have cost around $5 million to train when it was released in 2020. And subsequent models like Gopher and Chinchilla would have cost a bit more. And the most recent and most powerful model shown on this diagram, Palm, uh, released this year, or publicized this year would have cost around $27 million. And while in vision, the scale is not quite as extreme, it nevertheless uh, it can be quite computationally and economically expensive. Uh, one of these points on this diagram here, which involves large scale pre-training of a uh, transformer based image classification model, would have cost about $750,000. So all of these costs are really out of uh, reach of many researchers and practitioners, which means that uh, they have limited input into the development and creation of these valuable pre-trained models. And an, another 
implication of this cost is that many of the models that are being trained are actually being are not being released publicly. So until the last few years, it was pretty common, at least in the research community, that if a new pre-trained model came along that was better than previous models, it would be released and reused many, many times by many people to create better and better models on downstream tasks of interest. But increasingly, uh, beca partially because of the cost of these models, uh, when companies uh, train these models, they often don't release them. They either sell them behind an API or uh, just use them for internal purposes. Uh, in addition, many of the most performant and widely used pre-trained models are, were created by large companies. Uh, and while the release of these models is uh, very generous and they've uh, become very useful to many, many people, uh, it, the fact that it costs so much to create these models means that the large proportion of the research community doesn't get to contribute to their development in a significant way. So if you go, for example, on the Hugging Face Model Hub, which is a collection of many, many, many pre-trained models, and look at the models that have been downloaded the most, at least when I took this screenshot, all of the most downloaded models came from large resource-rich corporations. Um, so again, most of the research community uh, didn't participate in the development of these models. And notably, these models are typically released and then they're never updated. They're just kind of left as is until a better model comes along to supplant it. Which isn't really, in my view, the natural way for an artifact to exist. You know, there are many reasons that we might want to update or improve a pre-trained model. So if we look at one model, the T5 model that I developed with my colleagues at Google some years ago, there have been many kind of subsequent versions of T5 that have been proposed. For example, the unified QA model that took T5 and performed additional training on question answering data sets, or the MT5 model, which is a multilingual variant of T5. And in fact, if you look up T5 on the Hugging Face Model Hub, there are over a thousand models that have been based on T5. And while this is exciting in the sense that T5 is being improved by all kinds of people over time, the issue is that there's no principled way to track these updates and this improvement. There's no way to say that a new version of T5 that's better or is applicable, applicable to a new task has come along. Now, I'd like to contrast the state of affairs with open source software. So open source software is incredibly ubiquitous. Uh, it, it's used in consumer applications, in servers, uh, you know, m a, a very, very large proportion of software systems today either directly use or really heavily rely upon open source software. And the key point I want to make about open source software is that it's developed by a distributed community of collaborators who continually improve the software over time. So it's not just a small group behind closed doors creating software, releasing it, and then never improving it. It's a distributed community of people who are working together to make the software better and better. And this approach to software development has created a large amount of very, very valuable, very, very important software. And importantly, it also relies on a very mature and principled set of tooling, namely version control, continuous integration testing, and so on, that helps the maintainers of the software develop it to accept changes from contributors and decide whether they should be added to the, the library uh, to track its development over time to communicate updates and bug fixes and so on. And the main, my main point that I'm making in this talk is that we don't have such a system for development of pre-trained machine learning models at this point. So I'm going to talk to you about some work that we've done to try to make it possible to develop machine learning models more in the way that open source software is developed. I'll be trying to answer this question at a few different points in this talk. How can we enable collaborative and continual development of machine learning models? Well, the first thing that we need to be able to do is to make it so that contributors can cheaply communicate patches to a model. So if we have a pre-trained model, then how can we have a contributor cheaply communicate an update to that model so that maintainers can consider it for inclusion? So the difficulty in answering this question is that most modern machine learning models, neural networks specifically, are trained with gradient descent, which means that at every iteration of training, every one of the model's parameters is updated. So if I took a model and performed one additional step of training, then my patch would be as large as communicating the entire model, because I'd have to communicate every parameter of the model. 
So if we have you know a thousand contributors communicating many many different updates to the model, this will ex very quickly get too expensive and impractical uh, with today's systems. So the main idea behind this first work is that rather than updating all of the model's parameters, we're going to update only a very small subset, ideally as small of a subset as possible. Uh, and we're going to choose that subset of parameters, and then over many iterations of training, we're going to only update those specific parameters. And as long as that subset is very small, this will be a lot more cheap to communicate than, updated, than communicating the updated value of every parameter. So how are we going to pick this subset? We're going to use each parameter's fissure information. And if you're not familiar, the fissure information is essentially a measure of how much changing a particular parameter value will change the model's predictions. So if a parameter has a large fissure information, it means that that particular parameter contributes a lot to the outputs generated by the model. And so specifically, we'll take a model, we'll compute the fissure information, or specifically an approximation of the fissure information of each parameter, and then we'll take, we'll choose as a subset of parameters to update the k parameters that have the highest fissure information. So we'll, we'll find the top k fissure values. And then we'll use those, we'll use that mask of parameters as a subset of parameters to update over many iterations of training. And we call this mask the fissure-induced sparse unchanging mask, the fish mask. So how well does it work to use the fish mask? Well, if we take a pre-trained model, in this case BERT, and we fine-tune it on various tasks, in this case the task from the glue benchmark, we can ask if we update only the parameters chosen by the fish mask, how well does that perform compared to updating all of the model's parameters for various levels of mask sparsity? In other words, for various sizes of K of, of the subset of parameters that we're updating. And so you can see that actually, even when updating a very small percentage of the model parameters, let's say half a percent or even a tenth of a percent, we can very close, we can get very close to recovering the performance of updating all of the model's parameters. And in particular, if we just choose a random subset of parameters of the same size, it performs significantly worse. We can also apply fish mask training to distributed training where the, there are multiple workers training a single shared model and the goal is to reduce communication costs between workers as much as possible. In this case, we have multiple workers training a, a CIFAR-10 image classification model. And if we just do standard training where we update all of the model's parameters or dense updates, we might say, then we can reduce communication costs by having the workers communicate their updates with each other less often. But if we introduce the fish mask, we can also reduce communication costs by reducing the percentage of parameters that are updated at each iteration. So if you look at the dark green line where we're updating a ten, like 10% well, of the parameters, a tenth of the parameters, you can see that we can get a better trade-off between the total amount of communication done and the accuracy of the model than we would have if we were performing dense training and our only option was to have workers communicate less often. Now, if we use a smaller percentage of model parameters, in this case, 2% of the model parameters, we actually can't recover the performance of standard training. And if we use a random mask, we also can't recover the performance. So in subsequent work, we introduced another way of updating a machine learning model while only communicating a very small update uh, that we call IA3. And the basic idea behind IA3 is that at various locations in a neural network, where intermediate activations are, we're going to take a learned vector and multiply it against those activations. And specifically, we're going to be applying IA3 to transformer language models. And in this case, we're going to be multiplying the activations, the, the, the value activations, the key activations, and the inner activations of the feedforward networks by learned vectors. And it might not be immediately clear, but if you multiply activations in this way, where immediately before those activations is a matrix multiplication, which is true in all of these cases, you can actually take the vector and multiply the, the matrix, the rows of the matrix by that vector, and you have an equivalent operation to multiplying the activations themselves. And if you multiply the matrix in that way, you're essentially updating the matrix. But crucially, you're not updating all of the matrices parameters. You're just, up, you're just using a single vector to update the full matrix. So it's significantly more communication efficient. So if we evaluate IA3 on parameter efficient training, like we did with the fish mask, we can measure essentially what accuracy can we get at a particular parameter budget. So in this case, we're actually fine tuning 
a model called T0, which is based on T5, on a set of a, a, a variety of natural language processing tasks and measuring the average accuracy across those tasks. And in this case, all of these tasks are few shot tasks, so there are very few labeled examples for each of these tasks. And we compare it to many existing methods for doing parameter efficient training, including fish mask. And we found, uh, interestingly, that IA3 not only was uh, produced the best trade-off of the number of parameters updated and the performance, but also was the only method that outperformed training all of the model parameters. So in, in, at least in few shot settings, using IA3 to train your model is not only more parameter efficient, but also can produce better accuracy. Okay, so now I'll talk about a different line of work that attacks a different important problem in continuous and collaborative development of machine learning models, which is that maintainers of the machine learning model will need to be able to merge updates from different contributors. So if we have a shared model and you update it and I update it, then we would ideally both want to communicate our changes back to the maintainers, and then but the maintainer would need to decide how to combine our updates. And this is what we call a merge or a merge conflict in, in version control, and we need a similar operation for machine learning models. So in traditional gradient-based training of machine learning models, and in particular in transfer learning, we typically see pipelines like the two shown on the screen here. We have a pre-trained model shown in blue. We do some training on some kind of downstream task, or maybe in some cases we do what's called intermediate task training, where we first fine-tune the pre-trained model on a donor task, and then fine-tune it on our downstream task. And ideally doing this fine-tuning on the donor task will improve performance on the downstream task. So these are kind of typical gradient-based training pipelines. Now, if we introduce a merging operation, which is shown as this thick gray line, we actually can consider many more pipelines for updating a model. And I'll discuss some of these in a moment. Uh, but for example, we could take a pre-trained model, fine-tune it on many different downstream tasks, and then merge each of the fine-tuned models to get a sort of ensemble model that hopefully works better. Or we could emulate intermediate task training by taking a pre-trained model, separately training it on a donor task and a fine-tuned task, and then merging the updates to get a model that hopefully works about as well as, as standard intermediate task training. And I'll talk about some of these other pipelines as examples in just another moment. So how are we going to do merging? So we can motivate what we want to do with a merging operation via this equation here, which essentially is saying that we want to find the set of parameters that maximizes the log posterior distribution of each individual model, okay? So, uh, and, and, and we also will introduce a lambda hyperparameter that controls sort of the importance of model I. So if we have capital M different models, then a given posterior distribution is the distribution of parameter values theta given data set I. And we can multiply that by this lambda hyperparameter as a heuristic sort of scalar uh, importance value and essentially find this and ideally find the set of parameters that maximizes this quantity. Now, if we approximate the posterior with a isotropic Gaussian distribution, so a Gaussian distribution whose mean is the parameter values and whose uh, covariance matrix is the identity matrix, then this maximization procedure actually has a closed form solution, which is simply just performing a weighted average of all of the model's parameters where the weighting is done according to those lambda hyperparameters I mentioned. And this kind of model averaging actually exists in the literature, for example, in federated averaging or in, in model soups, which is a method for model ensembling. And because we're making this connection to maximizing the joint posterior, uh, we call this procedure isotropic merging because we're approximating each posterior as an isotropic Gaussian. Now in this paper we introduce a new method for merging that we call Fisher merging that uses a little PLOS approximation where the approximate Fisher information matrix is used as the precision matrix in our Gaussian approximation to the posterior. And if we make the Laplace approximation, what ends up happening is that we weight each parameter value not only by lambda, but also by the Fisher information of that parameter in a given model. So in other words, if a particular parameter is more important to a given model, it will be upweighted in this weighted average. So how does Fisher merging compared to isotropic merging. Well, let's consider this setting, which is now called uh, robust fine-tuning. So if we take a pre-trained model like CLIP, fine-tune it on a data set, 
we can then merge the fine-tune model and the pre-trained model, hopefully to improve performance on one or both tasks. And in this case, we're considering fine-tuning CLIP on various out-of-domain, out out-of-distribution data sets uh, that are sort of similar to ImageNet, but are different in meaningful ways that make them out of distribution. And if we perform robust fine-tuning by merging these two models with either isotropic merging or Fisher merging, you can see we get a better trade-off between the image inaccuracy, which is uh, CLIP's main task, and the OOD accuracy of the different uh, tasks that the CLIP model has been fine-tuned on. In addition, we can consider sort of unusual versions of intermediate task training, where, for example, we take BERT, fine-tune it on MNLI, which is a natural language inference data set that's known to really help RTE as a downstream task when performing intermediate task training. But then we can separately fine-tune BERT on a donor task and see whether merging the RTE model and the donor model improves performance over standard intermediate task training. And so if you look on the right, sure enough, it does. The, the dashed line is the original performance of the RTE model that just underwent MNLI intermediate task training. But by performing merging with various donor tasks, we can actually significantly boost performance of that model. And this pipeline would be onerous or maybe even impossible to uh, perform with standard gradient-based training because of catastrophic forgetting. If we, inter if we did MNLI training and then donor task training and then RTE training, the model likely would have sort of forgotten what it learned on the MNLI task and you wouldn't see any performance improvement at all. So the last piece that I'll mention some line of work attacking is this issue that if we're going to be versioning, if we're going to be developing very large models, it's possible that the individual contributors can't actually train or run those large models. Uh, so since most people lack access to uh, you know, supercomputers or at least a significant number of GPUs, we need a way for contributors who don't have that kind of computational access to train and run the models to make it possible for them to actually contribute to the development. In order to motivate our technique for making this possible, I'll first just mention as background uh, what's called pipeline parallelism, which is a way of training large models. So in pipeline parallelism, if you have four devices, these are accelerators like GPUs, you can split up the model by layer on the different devices. So one device is responsible for computing the uh, output and gradients of a subset of the layers. And because it's that device only needs to store and compute the outputs for a subset of the layers, it re significantly reduces the computational and memory costs. Now, in this work, instead of splitting the model's layers across devices, we're actually going to split it across peers. So these are peers in a swarm of volunteer compute that are going to be co collaborating together in order to compute the outputs and gradients of a model. And in particular, we're going to allow the peers to have different compute budgets. So one peer might have a single very powerful GPU, another peer might have uh, very many cheap GPUs, and as a result, they may be able to run more or less computation. The second important change that we'll make is that because these peers are going to be distributed over the internet, they need to be able to communicate the outputs of their layers and also the gradients of their layers very cheaply with the other peers. So how are we going to do that? We are going to compress the activations and gradients that these peers are communicating, uh, just using some standard compression techniques which will significantly lower the total communication cost over the internet. In addition, we're going to compress the weights of the individual layers. Uh, most neural networks are trained with either 32-bit or 16-bit flo uh, floating point numbers. We're actually going to use 8-bit values to represent most of the weights in the models, which makes the layers half or a quarter of the size and also can reduce the computational costs. This allows individual peers to be responsible for a larger subset of the layers. And then finally, if we have many peers who have announced that they are going to be able to run the inference or the training of a subset of the layers, we want to be able to find the most efficient chain of peers that will allow us to generate the output or gradients of a model as fast as possible. And what the most efficient chain is depends on the communication cost between the peers. You know, what, what internet connection do they have? How far apart are they? But also, what layers are they able to run? And our system, which we call Petals, automates all of these steps and makes it very simple to take an existing model and distribute it across peers on the internet.
So if we use pedals, we find that the speed at which we can run inference or training is quite similar to local servers that have powerful GPUs, assuming that there is some uh, bandwidth limitation and latency limitation. And in particular, our system pedals makes it possible to train and run inference on models with over 100 billion parameters uh, very efficiently, even when they're distributed across the world. So in addition to what I discussed today, that we have important future work to do to make it easier for maintainers to quickly vet community contributions. So if, if a community member submits a possible change to a machine learning model, the maintainers need to be able to decide whether they're going to include the change or not. This is automated testing in the development of open source software, and exhaustive evaluation of a, a pre-trained model is still an open question. In addition, open source software can often be combined in modular ways to add capabilities to an existing model. Uh, in machine learning models, it's not really possible to take a capability of one model, extract it, and combine it with another model so that that model achieves that capability. And again, this would be an interesting avenue for future work. So here are some pointers to the papers that I discussed today. You can find them all on Archive. And in addition, if you have any feedback for the talk that I gave, whether I was speaking too quickly or too slowly, too high level, too low level, you can give me feedback at the link at the bottom of the slide here. Thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Aidal Momen Nejad. I'm a principal researcher at Microsoft Research New York City. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about how pruning and cognitive science or brain-inspired AI um, can make AI hopefully more efficient and uh, more green. So um, it has been suggested by a certain numbers of computation that teaching a neural super network in a Microsoft data center might actually consume as much carbon um, um, CO2 carbon footprints as two trips to the moon with a car, which is not exactly something we would want. On the left, you can see how unhappy the moon might be. And on the right, I have created an image of a car driving to the moon with mid-journey. And as you can see, it's pretty gorish. And I think it's just as um, challenging as the fact that we are using so much carbon emissions just to train our networks. Now, in recent years, a number of papers that a wonderful review by MIT and IBM Watson AI Labs um, summarizes suggests that there are ways in which we could reduce this. For instance, uh, in 2015, it was shown that we can prune 90% or more parameters from trained neural networks without hurting their ability to solve the task they were trained to solve. And pruning, however, only reduces the cost of using a model after it is trained. A couple of years later, the lottery ticket hypothesis suggested that if we find out which were those lucky parameters that Actually, if you only change those, the, uh, the uh, network wouldn't function, but those are the ones that if you found, you could prune the rest of them, might be a solution so that we could potentially prune parameters before or early in training without any effect on the network's ability to learn successfully. And if we figure out the right parameters to prune, it is possible to train much smaller networks. I mean, at best, something that's 90% smaller. And since brain and, brains and evolution have done pruning for millennia, and actually for millions of years, um, it would be more interesting to see whether brain-inspired approaches might help us to have more efficient pruning or more efficient architectures in general. Uh, before I go any further, I want to clarify that I'm not going to be talking about anything that um, relates to having anyone in engineering or in AI use neural networks that are brain inspired or human behavior inspired. Actually, these are different axes, as I have discussed in a paper that is forthcoming in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. There are different goals and priorities for uh, networks with neural plausibility architectures uh, for benchmarking and engineering and um, uh, AI that shows human-like behavior. And success in one or two dimensions does not mean that that it's necessarily going to transfer. 
um, and it allows for non-binary evaluations. However, what I'm suggesting is that perhaps the solution to a more efficient approach to certain even engineering problems could come from brain-inspired architectures. Not necessarily, not the only solution, perhaps this is one of the solutions. With that, I will first start to uh, talk about cognitive science-inspired approaches, approaches inspired by human behavior. For this, I'm going to show you a little bit of the video that we work with together with everyone else at uh, MSR Cambridge and other parts of Microsoft Research. And we ask, uh, can cognitive science inspired approaches make AI for analyzing these complex multi-agent fast um, games more efficient? And in fact, we first, in two papers that have already been published, we built a navigation Turing test where we had a human play the game or an AI play the game or two different agents that performed equally well um, on navigation benchmarks uh, play the game and put them side by side and ask uh, human observers which one they thought is playing the game more human-like. Uh, or is more likely to have been played by an average human player. And then we asked them why they thought that. And we showed that even state-of-the-art agents that pass all the benchmarks, none of them really passes the Turing test. And more importantly, uh, two agents that have the same score on benchmarks, in fact, uh, are rated very differently in terms of how human-like they are. We have ongoing research in this area, and I recommend that you look at our papers. In the past two internship cycles, we have worked with Kimia Katarpal and Guy Davidson, my wonderful grad student interns, who worked on using concepts in cognitive science, such as task sets and affordances, to analyze large-scale complex Xbox data, like the game that you saw, to show not only more efficient analysis of human behavior, but also a more interpretable approach to analyzing the behavior, which I will show you in the next slide. Our moonshot is to design AI agents or RL agents that use these task sets instead of simple policies, which are sequences of actions or options, which are a number of different policies doing the same thing, but have to be trained on the same environment because um, uh, task sets allow for generalizability and interpretability. On the other hand, uh, uh, of course, one could say, oh, if I make my architectures large enough with large enough number of parameters, maybe I could still solve this task. But why not invest in architectures that don't uh, stumble upon generalizability, compositionality, transfer, things that we want by taking many rides to the moon and maybe they don't even stumble on, upon those. Why not design them with intention and with inspiration from uh, what we know uh, humans can actually already achieve? So uh, what we did in order to analyze variability of player behavior um, and test whether rewards, just simple rewards versus actual notions, high level notions of task sets, which are more interpretable, can capture them. We analyzed probability of fight or probability of flight behavior using notions of task sets in these games. Um, these are tens of thousands of games that people have been playing on Xbox from Bleeding Edge and produced unsupervised 2D embeddings for each player and then colored it either by a reward, which you will see on the left, or by fight uh, versus flight area under the curve curve ratio. You can see here that the reward does not actually capture uh, the variance of human behavior in space. You are not seeing any clustering in this kind of dimensionality reduction of the embedding space. But when you do color it with the fight versus flight uh, area under the curve ratio, you can see a nice clustering. We replicated this and tried a number of different things and showed that it's also not player ID that defines this, but uh, both the fight or flight behavior the clustering, even for a given player, depends on which character they are playing. So the same person can play the different characters with different strategies. So these were nice, uh, very recent uh, results and show that cognitive science approaches can lead to more efficient and more interpretable uh, analysis of game data. The last thing that I want to talk about is how brain-inspired architectures, for instance, architectures inspired by hippocampus or the prefrontal cortex, as well as neurocomputing architectures, could allow us uh, to improve. For instance, a brain-inspired AI that is inspired by the hippocampus could potentially do continual learning without catastrophic forgetting, because as you see here on the right side, my uh, good colleague and friend, uh, Anna Shapiro, who's a professor at Penn, had this beautiful paper showing that uh, um, 
simulating the architecture of the hippocampus allowed for pattern, pattern separation and completion, um, uh, the same way that hip, uh, the, the hippocampus does by having complementary learning systems. And such systems are capable of both clustering things together and associative learning, but also separating things. In that way, um, they could um, create more efficient architectures. On the other hand, uh, recent approaches are talking about how neuromorphic computing inspired by the hippocampus or the prefrontal cortex or other circuits in the brain could uh, be much faster um, and greener than just using general purpose GPUs if applied to the correct tasks. Another thing is um, the prefrontal cortex, uh, including tacits and cognitive controls, which I will talk a little bit more in detail. For instance, um, Yasha Bengio and colleagues wrote a paper recently called Deep Learning Needs a Prefrontal Cortex. And I ask here, does GPT-3 need a prefrontal cortex? And I hope that it will become clear why I'm saying that. Uh, John Cohen and others in 1990 had a paper called Under Control of Automatic Processes. Uh, not unlike the image that you see here on the right, there was a network that was a feed-forward network, and then there were control units that were controlling that. Since the 1990 until 2022 that you can see this particular network that was published, a neural network model of continual learning with cognitive control, the idea that you don't need to always expect the kind of feed-forward part or even if it has some recurrence, just as the part of the network that is um, very um, kind of uh, requires a lot of training to do all the job. You could add some kind of a cognitive control module that because it's higher level is more efficient and less costly uh, to control the output of the network. For instance, it's possible to build cognitive control and prefrontal cortex inspires, uh, inspired architectures to reduce GPT-3's bias by controlling saying, okay, Okay, don't give out that information, for instance, because it's a racist comment or such, and maybe reduces CO2. Why is that? Because with such an approach, there is no need to constantly retrain the GPT-3, which requires driving to the moon. Uh, but cognitive control can be trained to edit responses, for instance, uh, and similar approaches to prompt engineering. And here, in the sense of the neuromorphic computing that I mentioned, there was this recent um, figure of benchmarks by Intel showing that for specific tasks, and here on the right you can see the tasks that they uh, tested it on compared with other things like CPU, GPU, as you can see by the circles and diamonds and other shapes, and there are times where the neuromorphic uh, chip on certain tasks could outperform the others. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Sometimes making hardware that's specific to a task could massively reduce the footprint of AI that solves those tasks. So in short, I'm suggesting that pruning and cognitive science slash brain-inspired architectures perhaps can keep GPT-3 off the moon and reduce its bias. And I want to thank you and my interns, and let's together think about ways to reduce GPT-3's bias and keep it off the moon, and not just GPT-3, but other AI as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Alvarez Melis, and I'm a researcher in the MSR New England lab. And today I want to highlight some of our work on data-centric machine learning and its application to model repurposing. So repurposing machine learning models has ceased to be an esoteric problem and has become mainstream, even if it goes sometimes by different names. And the reason for this is obvious but bears repeating. In the era of large pre-trained models, um, repurposing models holds the key towards amortizing some of the cost that goes into training these models. And the cost is of several kinds. There's of course computational and energy costs involved in training them. There's costs in terms of the data that they consume and the architectures that they use and that have to be fine-tuned for specific tasks. So there's a lot of value baked into these models. And of course, we try to reuse them as much as possible uh, to amortize that cost. And in this context, the use and discard uh, framework does not really make much sense from an economic or even environmental perspective. And the archetypal form of repurposing is, of course, repurposing across different domains, which is also known as transfer learning. So in this setting, we typically have uh, uh, plenty of labeled data from one domain, let's say the source domain, and then we have limited amount of data from the domain of interest called the target domain. And how this is typically approached in machine learning is we take a model that is pre-trained on that large amount of data, and then we modify it, we fine tune it, so that uh, we use the additional data from the target domain, and then we can apply it and use it in that domain. And of course, this is, this is a useful and very simple approach, but it doesn't come without limitations. And these are most obvious when we're trying to do multi-purposing. So we're, we're, when we're trying to reuse a model for different and uh, multiple tasks at the same time. 
In this case, the adaptation that I just described has to happen many times over, and every time we're creating copies of these very large models that have to be stored somewhere. So of course, this is not the most efficient way to do it. In contrast to this uh, status quo approach, here we'll take a data-centric approach to repurposing, which basically means focusing on the data sets across which we're trying to repurpose. And then uh, based on that, uh, being able to answer questions like, can we predict if repurposing will succeed uh, across a pair of, of uh, tasks? Uh, can we modify data sets rather than uh, the models? And can we combine models based on their distributional activations? And in order to answer all of these questions, we'll rely on one main tool, which is Optimal Transport. So Optimal Transport is a mathematical gem at the intersection of optimization, statistics, and geometry, uh, which I really don't have time to describe, but I'll just briefly say that it's, it's a very powerful and flexible tool that uh, intertwines together three fundamental aspects in uh, mathematics and computer science, which are comparison, matching, and transformation of data sets in this case. It lies on a century's worth of theory uh, across uh, many uh, subfields and mathematicians, and it has seen staggering progress in terms of the efficiency of algorithms over the past decade or so. So here in this talk, we'll use optimal transport for model repurposing across three different case studies, starting from um, using it for uh, efficient data selection for transfer learning. And for this, I'll take this collection of, of data sets, the VTAP benchmark of uh, transfer learning, which is now a reference for uh, transfer learning in computer vision. It contains 19 different computer vision tasks. And a typical pipeline involves pre-training a model on ImageNet and then fine-tuning the model on one of these tasks and then comparing the performance. So we'll do that here. But in addition, uh, our question here is, can we predict how well the model is going to transfer based on some notion of similarity or distance between the data sets? And of course, we'll use a notion of distance based on optimal transport. So here in this plot, uh, to answer that question, uh, I'm going to show on the x-axis a no notion of distance uh, that we proposed in prior work, the optimal transport data set distance. And on the y-axis is a notion of transferability. So higher is better. And when we plot all these data sets uh, here, uh, the take home message is clear. This notion of distance that we propose is highly predictive of transferability and therefore can be used to select which uh, data sets uh, to transfer across. And we show that this holds across different settings and hardware parameter choices. So far, we're still modifying models, although we're doing it from a data-centric perspective uh, using information from data set similarity. But as I promised before, uh, this kind of begs the question, can we instead implicitly repurpose models uh, by modifying the data sets rather than the models themselves? And that's what we will look at next. And for this, um, I want to refer to this other uh, follow-up work in which we propose a general setting for optimization of data sets. And what this looks like is as follows. Imagine you have some pre-training data and some objective, for example, similarity to a target data set of interest, and then some constraints. And in the framework that we propose, we use gradient flows uh, and optimal transport to uh, minimize this objective uh, and therefore find a data set that satisfies these constraints. For simple toy settings, this might look like uh, trying to take a data set row zero and make it look like row star, subject to some constraints, for example, linear separability. And we show that indeed we can achieve that. When we just uh, optimize for distance, we can recover the data set faithfully. If we just optimize for the uh, constraint, we can achieve linear separability. And when we combine them, we can recover the target data set with this uh, added linear separability. But of course, this is more interesting when we're looking at repurposing. So here, I'm taking a model that has been pre-trained on CIFAR 10, and then it's, it's frozen. So its weights will be completely frozen across all of this. And then in addition, I'm taking an additional data set that has limited labels, uh, histopathology. And I'm going to take that data set and flow it back towards CIFAR 10, which is the domain of expertise of this model, so to speak. And as I do that, I'm going to show in this plot uh, the accuracy of this model on the flow data. Uh, compared to a baseline of not doing any adaptation and a baseline of training a simple but good model on the limited amount of data that we have from this task. And you'll see, uh, based on a sample of, of particles, of images from this data, that they change not, not too obviously, but still the performance of this model is improving greatly to the point that it's surpassing uh, this very strong baseline that we started with. So this shows that we can effectively repurpose models without touching a single of their weights by instead moving and flowing data across domains. And of course, we can take this idea and sort of put it on steroids by doing it across multiple domains at the same time. So here, for example, for a model that has been trained on MNIST, I'm flowing multiple other data sets toward, towards MNIST and using the same model without any modification to classify all of these data sets at the same time to a pretty reasonable degree of accuracy. 
And finally, the last uh, project that I want to highlight is using uh, this data-centric approach for um, model stitching. So model stitching is an approach that was proposed recently uh, to understand the representation power of neural networks. And basically what it means is that we take two networks. The first one will cut and then discard all its top layers. Uh, for the second one, we'll discard its bottom layers. And then we put a stitching layer in between them, and then we train uh, this layer through typical cross-entropy uh, with backpropagation. So in prior work, Bansal and colleagues uh, used it to analyze representation similarity. But there's an open question of what is the optimal level in to, to stitch to, to models. And there's some evidence from, from some fields like medical imaging that earlier layers might be better for certain tasks than others. So here our goal was to find a principle and data-driven approach to stitching combined models. And the way we do it, and this is ongoing work with my intern Alex Darchakovian, is to think about models as distribution uh, modifiers. So we start with a data distribution, and each subsequent layer is uh, imposing some change on it, formally a push-forward distribution. And when we look at the two models that we're trying to compare and the distributions that they uh, implicitly define, we can compare them using, again, optimal transport and in particular vast and distances. And this is what we do, and it allows us to find correspondences across completely different architectures, like ResNet and Inception v3, and then using that information to find optimal ways to stitch the models together. Furthermore, we can also use uh, the notion of distribution and distance to train the model itself. So without having to rely on, on label data for cross-entropy training, instead here we train this uh, layer purely based on distribution and distance using a Wasserstein loss. And just to give you a sneak peek of a potential uh, application and result, here I'm taking two ResNet 50 models with different weights. So they're both uh, trained on ImageNet, but with different initializations, stitching them across different levels. And then showing here the performance of the, of the model as we uh, train it. And here the takeaway message is that uh, we can stitch these models efficiently. So we are essentially recovering the accuracy of the original models. Uh, stitching in earlier layers is slower to train, but eventually achieves better performance. And if we try to skip some layers uh, by stitching across non-consecutive layers, then the performance drops as expected, but uh, less so for uh, earlier layers in the network. So these are the main lessons from, from this. And overall, the takeaway message for this talk is that uh, in contrast to typical repurposing that focuses on, on models, here we do repurposing by focusing on datasets to inform and even replace model adaptation. For example, to predict when and where to adapt uh, using data, uh, to adapt models implicitly by flowing data instead of models, and by combining models by matching data distributions. And I'm going to leave you with some pointers to a blog post, a uh, couple of, of uh, papers uh, backing up this work. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. And I thank you very much for your attention. And please do reach out if you have any questions about any of these uh, projects. Thank you very much.